Financial success is not a hard science. It's a soft skill where how you behave is more important than what you know. We call this soft skill the psychology of money. The aim of this masterpiece by Morgan Housel is to gain these soft skills so you can shape your dream financial life. We're gonna deep dive into topics like compounding effect, margin of safety, tail events, wealth, saving and etc. Make sure to stick to the end of video as I have a special gift for you. Ronald James Reed was a philanthropist, investor, janitor and gas station attendant. Reed fixed cars at a gas station for 25 years and swept floors for 17 years. He bought a two-bedroom house for $12,000 at age 38 and lived there until he passed away in 2014 when he had a net worth of over $8 million. Guess what? It turned out that there was no secret. There was no lottery win and no inheritance. Reed saved what little he could and invested in blue chip stocks. Then he waited for decades on end as tiny savings compounded into more than $8 million. Of that, he donated $6 million to schools and hospitals. That's it, from janitor to philanthropist. He performed better than many Harvard-educated business people. It's impossible to think of a story about Ronald Reed performing a heart transplant better than a Harvard-trained surgeon. But these stories do happen in investing. Now answer my question. Is every outcome in your financial life caused by your individual effort? Back in 1968, when most universities didn't have a computer, 13-year-old Bill Gates went to one of the only high schools in the world that had a computer. A little quick math. In 1968, there were roughly 300 million high school age people in the world, according to the UN. About 18 million of them lived in the United States. About 270,000 of them lived in Washington State, and only about 300 of them attended Lakeside School. Start with 300 million, end with 300. Only one in a million high school age students attended the high school that had a computer. Bill Gates happened to be one of them. Gates is not shy about what this meant. If there had been no Lakeside, there would have been no Microsoft, he told. Gates is exaggeringly smart, even more hardworking and, as a teenager, had a vision for computers that even most computer executives couldn't grasp. He also had a one in a million head start by going to school at Lakeside. Now let me tell you about Gates' friend Kent Evans. He experienced an equally powerful dose of something else called risk. Kent was by Gates' own account the best student in the class. He was as skilled with computers as Gates. Kent could have been a founding partner of Microsoft with Gates, but it would never happen. Kent died in a mountain accident before he graduated high school. The odds of being killed on a mountain in high school are roughly one in a million. Bill Gates experienced one in a million luck by ending up at Lakeside. Kent Evans experienced one in a million risk by never getting to finish what he and Gates set out to achieve. The same force, the same magnitude, working in opposite directions. Back to our question, luck and risk are both the reality that every outcome in life is guided by forces other than individual effort. They both happen because the life is too complex to allow 100% of your actions to dictate 100% of your outcomes. They are driving by the same thing. You are 1% in a game with 7 billion other people and infinite moving parts. The impact of actions outside of your control can be more consequential than the ones you consciously take. Say I buy a stock and 5 years later it's gone nowhere. It's possible that I made a bad decision by buying it in the first place. 
It's also possible that I made a good decision that had an 80% chance of making money and I just happened to end up on the side of the unfortunate 20% risk. How do I know which is which? Did I make a mistake or did I just experience the reality of risk? If you give luck and risk their proper respect, you realize that when judging people's financial success, both your own and others, it's never as good or as bad as it seems. But this is not an easy problem to solve. The difficulty in identifying what is luck, what is skill, and what is risk is one of the biggest problems we face when trying to learn about the best way to manage money. To maximize the role of your efforts and minimize the role of luck and risk in your financial life, focus less on specific individuals and case studies and more on broad patterns. Studying a specific person can be dangerous because we tend to study extreme examples. The billionaires, the CEOs, or the massive failures that dominate the news. The more extreme the outcome, the less likely you can apply its lessons to your own life, because it is more probable the outcome was influenced by the extreme ends of luck or risk. You'll get closer to actionable takeaways by looking for broad patterns of success and failure. The more common the pattern, the more applicable it might be to your life. Trying to emulate Warren Buffett's investment success is hard because his results are so extreme that the role of luck in his lifetime performance is very likely high. And luck isn't something you can reliably emulate. But realizing that people who have control over their time tend to be happier in life is a broad and common enough observation that you can do something with it. Now let's talk about when rich people do crazy things. Bernie Madoff was a famous and legitimate market maker. He was making about $50 million per year. Then one day in pursuit of even more money, he started committing crimes. He performed Ponzi schemes to gain even more money. Firstly, he got away with it, but after a while, he was jailed and lost everything. The question we should ask is why someone worth hundreds of millions of dollars would be so desperate for more money that he risked everything in pursuit of even more. Crime committed by those living on the edge of survival is one thing, but what Madoff did is something different. He already had everything, unimaginable wealth, prestige, power, and freedom, and he threw it all away because he wanted more. He had no sense of enough. The hardest financial skill is getting the goalposts to stop moving. It gets dangerous when the taste of having more, more money, more power, more prestige increases ambition faster than satisfaction. In that case, one step forward pushes the goalpost two steps ahead. You feel as if you're falling behind and the only way to catch up is to take greater and greater amounts of risk. But life isn't fun without a sense of enough. Happiness, as it said, is just results minus expectations. Now consider a rookie basketball player who earns half a million dollars a year. He's by any definition rich. But say he plays on the same team as Mike Trout who earns $36 million a year. By comparison, the rookie is broke. But then think about Mike Trout. He earns an insane amount of money. But compared to people like Warren Buffet, whose personal fortune increased by $3.5 billion in a single year, that's nothing. And someone like Buffet could look ahead to Jeff Bezos, whose net worth increased by $24 billion in a year. The point is that the ceiling of social comparison is so high that virtually no one will ever hit it, which means it's a battle that can never be won or that the only way to win is not to fight to begin with, to accept that you might have enough even if it's less than those around you. But remember that enough is not too little. The idea of having enough might look like conservatism leaving opportunity and potential on the table. But that's not right. Enough is realizing that the opposite, which is an unsatiable appetite for more, 
will push you to the point of regret. There are many things never worth risking, no matter the potential gain. Reputation, freedom, independence, happiness, family and friends are invaluable. And your best shot at keeping these things is knowing when it's time to stop taking risks that might harm them. Knowing when you have enough. You don't need tremendous force to create tremendous results. You need time. More than 2,000 books are dedicated to how Warren Buffet built his fortune. Warren Buffet's net worth is $84.5 billion. Of that, more than 99% accumulated after his 50th birthday. 96% just came after his 65th birthday. Had he started investing in his 30s and retired in his 60s, few people would have ever heard of him. Buffet began serious investing when he was 10 years old. By the time he was 30, he had a net worth of $1 million. What if he was a more normal person spending his teens and 20s exploring the world and finding his passion, and by age 30, his net worth was, say, $25,000? And let's say he still went to earn the extraordinary annual investment returns like 22% but quit investing and retired at age 60 to play golf and spend time with his grandkids. What would the roughest mate of his net worth be today? Not $84.5 billion but $12 million. 99% less than his actual net worth. Effectively, all of Warren Buffett's financial success can be tied to the financial base he built in his pubescent years and the longevity he maintained in his geriatric years. His skill is investing, but his secret is time. That's how compounding works. Good investing is not necessarily about earning the highest returns. It's about earning pretty good returns that you can stick with and which can be repeated for the longest period of time. That's when compounding runs wild. Getting money is one thing, but keeping it is another. Getting money requires taking risks, being optimistic, and putting yourself out there. But keeping money requires the opposite of taking risk. It requires humility and fear that what you've made can be taken away from you just as fast. So how can you stay wealthy? Tell yourself that more than I want big returns, I want to be financially unbreakable. And if I'm unbreakable, I actually think I'll get the highest returns, because I'll be able to stick around long enough for compounding to work wonders. It's not whether you're right or wrong that's important, but how much money you make when you're right and how much money you lose when you're wrong. You can be wrong half the time and still make a fortune. Take Amazon. It's not intuitive to think that a failed product launch at a major company would be normal and fine. Intuitively, you think the CEO should apologize to shareholders. But CEO Jeff Bezos said shortly after the disastrous launch of the company's Fire Phone, If you think that's a big failure, we're working on much bigger failures right now. I'm not kidding. Some of them are going to make the Fire Phone look like a tiny little bleep. It's okay for Amazon to lose a lot of money on the Fire Phone because it will be upset by something like Amazon Web Services that earns tens of billions of dollars. A lot of things in business and investing work this way. Tail events, the farthest ends of a distribution of outcomes, have tremendous influence in finance where a small number of events can account for the majority of outcomes. The ability to do what you want, when you want, with who you want, for as long as you want, is priceless. It's the highest dividend money pays. Money is greatest interesting value, and this can't be overstated, is its ability to give you control over your time. A small amount of wealth means the ability to take a few days off work when you're sick without breaking the bank. A bit more means waiting for a good job to come around after you get laid off, rather than having to take the first one you find. 
six months emergency expenses means not being terrified of your boss because you know you won't be ruined if you have to take some time off to find a new job. More wealth means the ability to take a job with lower pay but flexible hours. Then there's retiring when you want to instead of when you need to. Using your money to buy time and options has a lifestyle benefit few luxury goods can compete with. United States is the richest nation in the history of the world, but there's little evidence that its citizens are on average happier today than they were in the 1950s, when wealth and income were much lower. A 2019 poll of 150,000 people in 140 countries found that about 45% of Americans said they felt a lot of worry the previous day. The global average was 39%. But why? Part of what's happened here is that although we have greater wealth to buy bigger and better stuff, we've simultaneously given up more control over our time. At this, those things cancel each other out. Wealth is what you don't see. If you see someone driving a Ferrari, are they considered wealthy? Someone driving a 100,000 car might be wealthy, but the only data point you have about their wealth is that they have 100,000 less than they did before they bought the car, or $100,000 more in debt. That's all you know about them. We should be careful to define the difference between wealthy and rich. Rich is about current income. Someone driving a $100,000 car is almost certainly rich, because even if they purchase the car with debt, you need a certain level of income to afford the monthly payment. Same with those who live in big homes. It's not hard to spot rich people. They often go out of their way to make themselves known. But wealth is hidden. It's income not spent. Wealth is an option not yet taken to buy something later. Its value lies in offering you options, flexibility, and growth to one day purchase more stuff than you could right now. Wealth is financial assets that haven't yet been converted into the stuff you see. That's why spending money to show people how much money you have is the fastest way to have less money. If wealth is what you don't spend, what good is it? Well, let me convince you to save money. The first idea, simple but easy to overlook, is that building wealth has little to do with your income or investment returns and lots to do with your savings rate. If you view building wealth as something that will require more money or big investment returns, the path forward looks hard and out of your control. But if you view it as powered by your own frugality and efficiency, the destiny is clearer. Wealth is just the accumulated leftovers after you spend what you take in. More importantly, the value of wealth is relative to what you need. Say you and I have the same net worth, and say you are a better investor than me, I can earn 8% annual returns and you can earn 12%. But I'm more efficient with my money. Let's say I need half as much money to be happy while your lifestyle compounds as fast as your assets. I'm better off than you are despite being a worse investor. I'm getting more benefit from my investments despite lower returns. Past a certain level of income, what you need is just what sits below your ego. Everyone needs the basics. Once they're covered, there's another level of comfortable basics. And past that, there's basics that are both comfortable, entertaining, and enlightening. But spending beyond a pretty low level of materialism is mostly a reflection of ego approaching income. A way to spend money to show people that you have money. When you define savings as the gap between your ego and your income, you realize why many people with decent income save so little. It's a daily struggle against instincts to extend your peacock feathers to their outermost limits and keep up with others doing the same. But wealthy people with enduring financial success, not necessarily those with high incomes or rich people, tend to have a propensity to not 
give a damn what others think about them. So people's ability to save is more in their control than they might think. And you don't need a specific reason to save. Some people save money for a down payment on a house or a new car or for retirement. That's great, of course, but saving doesn't require a goal of purchasing something specific. You can save just for saving's sake. Only saving for a specific goal makes sense in a predictable world, but ours isn't. Saving is a hedge against life's inevitable ability to surprise the hell out of you at the worst possible moment. The question then is how should we think about and plan for the future? The solution is simple. Use room for error when estimating your future returns. This is more art than science. For my own investments, I assume the future returns I'll earn in my lifetime will be one third lower than the historic average. So I save more than I would if I assume the future will resemble the past. It's my margin of safety. The future may be worse than one third lower than the past, but no margin of safety offers a 100% guarantee. A one third buffer is enough to allow me to sleep well at night. And if the future does resemble the past, I'll be pleasantly surprised. An important causing of room for error is what I call optimism bias in risk-taking or Russian roulette should statistically work syndrome. The idea is that you have to take the risk to get ahead, but no risk that can wipe you out is ever worth taking. The odds are in your favor when playing Russian roulette, but the downside is not worth the potential upside. There's no margin of safety that can compensate for the risk. So every time you plan for the future, you have to give yourself room for error. You have to plan on your plan not going according to plan. What other factors should we consider while planning? I grew up with a friend who came from neither privilege nor natural intellect, but was the hardest working guy I ever knew. His life's mission and dream as a teenager was to be a doctor. He pushed, and a decade older than his classmates, he eventually became a doctor. How much fulfillment comes from starting from nothing, bulldozing your way to the top of medical school and achieving one of the most noble professions against all odds? I spoke to him a few years ago. The conversation went like this. Long time no talk. How are you doing? Awful career. Mm, well, awful career, man. This went on for 10 minutes. The stress and hours had worn him into the ground. He seemed so disappointed. We don't know what the future holds. It's another to admit that you yourself don't know today what you will even want in the future. The end of history illusion is what psychologists call the tendency for people to be keenly aware of how much they've changed in the past but to underestimate how much their personalities, desires, and goals are likely to change in the future. But there are two things to keep in mind when making what you think are long-term decisions. You should avoid the extreme ends of financial planning, assuming you'll be happy with a low income or choosing to work endless hours in pursuit of a high income increases the odds that you'll one day find yourself at a point of regret. Aiming at every point in your working life to have moderate annual savings, moderate free time, no more than a moderate commute, and at least moderate time with your family increases the odds of being able to stick with a plan and avoid regret than if any one of those things fall to the extreme sides of the spectrum. Everything has a price, but not all prices appear on labels. The S&P 500 increased 119-fold in the 50 years ending 2018. All you had to do was sit back and let your money compound. But of course, successful investing looks easy when you're not the one doing it. Hold stocks for the long run. You'll hear it's good advice, but do you know how hard it is to maintain a long-term outlook when stocks are collapsing? Like everything else worthwhile, successful investing demands a price, but its currency is not dollars and cents. It's volatility, fear, doubt, uncertainty, and regret. 
all of which are easy to overlook until you're dealing with them in real life. Few investors have the disposition to say, I'm actually fine if I lose 20% of my money. Beware taking financial cues from people playing a different game than you are. Cisco stock rose 300% in 1999 to $60 per share. At that price, the company was valued $600 billion, which is insane. Few people actually thought it was worth that much. The day traders, however, were just having their fun. But if you were a long-term investor in 1999, $60 was the only price available to buy, and many people were buying it at that price. So you may have looked around and said to yourself, wow, maybe these other investors know something I don't. What you don't realize is that the traders who were setting the marginal price of this stock were playing a different game than you were. $60 a share was a reasonable price for the traders, because they planned on selling this stock before the end of the day, when its price would probably be higher. But $60 was a disaster in the making for you, because you planned on holding shares for the long run. A takeaway here is that few things matter more with money than understanding your own time horizon and not being persuaded by actions and behaviors of people playing different games than you are. And for the last part, as I have promised you, I've got a gift for you. You can now download this diagram from the link in the description below and read the best sentences of this incredible book. To access more visual summaries of the best books, subscribe to my channel and give a thumbs up.